the title discussion of documents really grew out of some doctoral research um, that tried to explore the relationship between sort of an art discourse and a documentary practice. A lot of contemporary photographic practice now really sort of lives and operates within an art discourse. And I wanted to try and find a way where documentary practices, uh, use of photographic images, can be used to still comment on society without it becoming subsumed into a kind of a, a, an art world that really was obsessed with the object or with aesthetics primarily. And to do that, I discovered a lot of art practices that really tried to provoke debate. And I really saw debate as the key to this. So rather than the, the photograph becoming evidence of what was, you know, traditionally the idea of the documentary being, uh, you point a camera at something as a document of something that happened, that was there. I wanted to try and use uh, photographic images within a gallery space that could really provoke or promote reflection and discussion as opposed to merely sort of mutely bearing witness. And so what I decided to do was to decide to, to use a little experiment. I mean, because the discursive documents at this stage had only ever been a theoretical exploration and I'd never really tested the ideas out. And so I had the opportunity to invite six artists. And so I decided to pair uh, two artists, not necessarily against each other, but more uh, set them up facing each other. So for example, and I, uh, I would use Richard Mulhern and Richard Higginbottom, um, whose work is very straightforwardly photographic, uh, but their images are really quite ambiguous. And so the question that we can raise and we can debate is really around photograph. What do we think photographs are? What do we think we're looking at when we're looking at photographs? The second one, uh, Seba Curtis and Alex Balde, are photographers who explore the issue of refugees, but from two quite different strategies. And that was, wasn't necessarily about strategies of representation, that was about the issues of refugees. And so it was an opportunity to talk about this issue. It was very interesting actually, that both the artists uh, are European. And given the context of Brexit, their own status uh, as, as citizens in this country was, is, is now under question, it's, it's been undermined. And then finally, there were two female artists um, who both look at issues around f uh, representations of femininity. And again, who work in much more sort of sculptural, they use animation and GIFs. And we use that to uh, discuss just that, the, the, the various different representations and how they challenge traditional understandings of representations of the feminine. The, the themes themselves uh, really were, uh, grew out of the artists. The overarching theme was just an opportunity to try and see if we could use the gallery and use photographic practices to not necessarily point to what had happened, but to open up discussions to what is possible. I set up actual debates. I timetabled and invited the artists to come, but then I invited a responder. So I asked somebody who had a particular interest in that subject matter to respond to both pieces of work. So I, and that was a way to sort of seed the debate, if you like. So I, I, I would uh, introduce the artists. I would let the artists speak about their work, but generally I ask the responder to discuss their take on the work. And, and their take then generally promoted, promoted the discussion. I didn't have any particular desire for people to come away with a particular reading of any of these issues. Uh, really, the, the thing was, was just to promote debate. As an experiment, I think it did work. I think the debates that it opened, the discussions, and it offered people opportunities to, ref, to, to respond to the work, but also to sort of respond to some of the assumptions that maybe I might have had about the work. For example, I was challenged very directly on some of the assumptions I had around femininity uh, by, by, uh, by one, one of just a member of the, the audience. There's a, a, a text, a relatively problematic text by Habermas who creates this theoretical realm called the public sphere. And I was using that as a model, uh, as a way to create a genuinely sort of open and uh, uh, equal space um, for people to talk. I, I might have been the curator and the artist might have been there or I invited a speaker, but I, I tried to make it very apparent that they weren't the authorities, that really they were just starting the, the, the process. And, and for example, the seating that we had for the debates was done in a circle. We didn't have it as a, a row of seating facing a, a raised platform. One of the things that was very well mannered, maybe that's the gallery space. It would be interesting, I think antagonism and dissensus is as important as a discussion that can build consensus. You know, Habermas under, you know, constructs this theoretical idea of the public space as a way to build or to arrive at a consensus. 
Um, I'm interested, as interested in people disagree as, as possibly agree. So that was maybe one thing I would I would consider that it was a bit well mannered. I come from I come from Belfast. I'm used to people being <laughs> people disagreeing with each other. So I kind of miss that. I had a long sort of period of time where I'd been shooting sort of editorial work, and not re and really sort of being fascinated by certain things that I couldn't really sort of put my finger on, and I'd got sort of a couple of thousand pictures really that I was really sort of interested in. And obviously it's quite a significant piece of work. And although I shoot in, digi in, in shoot digitally, I, I'm not really particularly uh, interested in reviewing the work quickly. I, I sort of started this process where I was editing down from the 2000. And, and that's initially a, quite an intuitive process. And from that 2000, I probably got to sort of a couple of hundred relatively quickly. So at that point, I really started to think about the world of the work that was made by the images. I probably printed the 200 out onto A4 laser copies and looked at them and lived with them. Uh, and again, got down to probably about 50 or 60 relatively quickly. And that's when the work began really, because that's what was really most difficult to sort of establish. What, what was actually uh, going on in those 50 or 60 pictures that made them interesting and how few would I need to tell the, tell the story? So from a very, very sort of intuitive moment of capture through an intuitive moment of edit, you reach a very carefully planned, detailed process of examination. You start to look for patterns in the work and repetitions in the work. Now these things can link, link they don't link in time or space because the work that ended up in Curb is shot in a number of different locations and, uh, and geographical environments. When I was looking to establish that edit that you see in Curb, I was looking for that kind of consistency of vision, of, of, of occurrence, but most importantly, I think, is the unusual gesture, the unexpected or the unreadable event occurring in a way that it seems entirely plausible. And at that point, I still didn't have the title. It was only when I was showing it to a very good friend, she suggested there's an event happening here that's across the pictures where there's there's people making a decision that uh, they're unconscious of and there's one particular picture that was in the show of a woman and she's kind of making an, a completely unexplainable gesture but she's surrounded by a whole sort of set of conventions and instructions that we obey and we follow without any kind of th thought and my friends just said well you, you know she stood on the curb and it was like, yeah, well, that makes total sense because a curb is something we stop at without thought. And that then basically pulled all the other pictures together. They seem to address this wonderful actions or gestures that we perform unconsciously, which reject convention. As much as we love it, I think, we still can't help kicking against it. And I, don't, I think the work very much celebrates that uh, that process of kicking against it. Cut World is essentially an exploration of the city, so using Manchester as the main place to make the work. I also spent some time in London exploring the city as a space where people interact and that people use. But the work was based on a piece of writing, an essay by someone called Michel de Soto. Um, it's called Walking in the City. So it was an exploration of that text as a way to explore photographically and to learn a little bit about the workings of the city with my camera. De Soto talks about an innumerable mass of singularities. So that was one of the key phrases that I was inspired by whilst making the work. Um, it was those small moments and those tiny details that happen in the city, the intricacies. Cities have dead ends and sharp turns and all those kind of things. So I was in really interested in exploring those tiny, small gestures and those small details that are a big part and a big makeup of that kind of space. With me, it was about these interactions and it was about waiting for moments and for things to happen where people might just be off guard or somebody might be making this really small gesture 
where they do something slightly different or they move in a different kind of direction. Cut Weld also has that element of development in there. You're seeing through the photographs the city changing and you're seeing um, new buildings going up and you're seeing little traces of scaffolding and things like that. So there's that little hint to the change and I suppose that ties in nicely with the title as well. Like this idea of cutting something and welding it and changing and putting things back together. I started the project in, in 2016. It just came after I had already done a project in the UK on the, well, with refugees and the border situation over here. And I was just curious to see the differences between how uh, countries, which are both in the European Union, they, they deal with refugees and how they try to help them. A refugee center in Salzburg, besides my own photographs, I tried to incorporate imagery that they produced, either back home, photographs taken during their journeys, and even photographs that they started taking after, after their arrival in, in Austria. There was a selfie actually taken by, by one of them. Uh, he was, that was an interesting one because he actually took the photograph in Turkey, yeah, and he was, he was just boarding a boat to go to Greece. Uh, he took the photograph. He sent it to a friend, I think, via WhatsApp, and he actually dropped the phone in the water. So without the internet and without WhatsApp, that image wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, and yeah, the big, the big print it was actually a drawing, which I found in the, uh, in the refugee center in Salzburg. The girl who, who made that drawing, she was not there anymore, so I've never really met her. But, but yeah, this one, I think, has a pretty strong visual impact. Yeah, it was signed Asma, which I never made. It's a girl's name. All meetings started with a discussion and some of them lasted for hours. And I would even forget about my camera and the afterwards would be, oh wait, I'll have to, I'm here to do a photographic project. To me, it didn't really matter if I took the photographs or if they took the photographs, especially that, well, their photographs are, they have a bigger impact, I think, because they, they were in situations that I didn't get to, they were in places that maybe I didn't have access to. And then my photographs, I tend to look at them as a record of, you know, these people are real, they're not just stories, they're like real people, real families, and yeah, I think that's a way of, well, for me and hopefully for the viewers to go beyond stereotypes. I've been working in immigration for like nearly 10 years now and uh, so for all my projects and all my travels I just I, I always try to um, when I hang out with these guys uh, I try to get the little stories that resonates to me and, and, and try to just make sense of it uh, with, with my photography so for this specific for Talcum it's, uh, it was um, this group of guys they tried to cross from France to England hiding in a, in a tank full of talcum in a lorry. They caught them and there are some CCTV cameras of them trying to jump on the motorway, and them one, and they're full cover on, on talcum powder. So they look like kind of like ghost almost. So um, I tried to represent that episode on, with, with my own work. And I was working in Sherbrooke in uh, Normandy in a clandestine, little clandestine camp. So I started to take portraits and, uh, and then I, that impediment of the talcum, I tried to translate it on, on my picture. So I, I started to photograph the rock of the talcum pounder before it gets processed. And I put them inside the frame, just next to the portrait. So that impediment of, of crossing of, of the identity of, of the immigrants, that they don't have a face anymore. I try to just represent it with the talcum. That's how it comes about. 2001 was a really difficult period for uh, Argentina, for my country. I was born in Buenos Aires. And the, the banks, they made a pact with the government and they froze your money. So whatever you have, it gets in the, in the bank. You, you don't not allow to your own money, to your own savings. So it's not just me, like flew from a better 
life. Many, many families, hundreds of thousands of families, they just go to the roots. We have these European roots, like my family is Greek, my family is Italian. So we all go back to the roots and try to, to, to make a new life in, in, in Europe. Uh, and that's where I met, when, when the reality shocked me, when I met all these people from deep Africa, Senegal, Nigeria. And that wasn't a topic like the news cover, so it was all new for me. I was working in a construction site illegally with these guys, and, and I see the reality of this guy trying to cross on a handmade boat and pay to a trafficker and sell a lot of stuff of his own family just to cross and, and, and be treated like awfully in, in, in Europe. So that really shocked me and resonated to me a lot. And uh, so when I started photography here in England, that was, it was a natural process to go through, through that and try to, you know, to don't forget and try to just work on, on that subject. I have a really um, strong influence from when I start to photograph, when I start uh, to try to be a photographer. I was in Buenos Aires and I didn't have enough money to do a, a course. So I just um, went to this free course like you can, you can uh, learn how to dance tango, how to knit or being a photographer. So it was a full of pensioners people like all with these really old school nice cameras. I didn't have money for a camera. So the teacher said to me, doesn't matter, come bring magazines. So I, the first six months of the course, I bring doing collage. He made me do collage to understand composition. And it's something like I got really attached to it and I, and I, found, I found it fascinating. So when I have the chance to study in England, I become a photographer. I always work with five by four because of that reason. I can manipulate the negative with my own hands and try to add elements uh, in a really physical way. Some, uh, one, of the, one of the curators of one of my show call it like interventions, what I do. I, li I like that kind of uh, work, like it's not just being there and trying to appropriate a moment, taking a picture. It's, it's something, try to make sense of it in, in a more deep and engaging way, in my opinion, in my, my kind of art. Really, as, as bodies, we're, we're really quite open and our boundaries between ourselves, our physical bodies and the things that we wear or the things that we use or the things that we may incorporate into ourselves are really open and, and flexible. So that's really at the heart of my work and that's why I use collage because I'm cutting together lots of bodies and things and, and kind of making new configurations of, of female bodies that, um, that quite playfully explore these ideas of, of you know, who we are, what we are, what, but actually what we might look like and what femininity might look like or what gender looks like. So it's all quite kind of fantastical in a way. I made some animations out of the collage, so I made some GIFs. Because it wasn't a smooth animation, you got these glitches and, and stutters and I found those glitches and stutters really fascinating. And in a way, it's a way of introducing this idea of holes and gaps and disrupting the seamlessness of the body through the gaps and stutters in, in the gifts. And the particular gifts that I showed in the gallery use the motif of the mouth quite a lot. And wherever you stick a mouth on a collage, well, it becomes a face, but also it's like a portable portal, it's a hole, it's a way in to the body. So what I was doing with the gifts is in a way trying to turn the body inside out. So I had this kaleidoscopic kind of circular motion really. And, and basically you could read it as a, as a woman just eating herself and expelling herself. So I felt that the gifts were, were just straddling that line really between beautiful and grotesque. And I, I think that's something I want to do with most of my work, try and find that balance really, it draws us in, but at the same time, it can make us quite uncomfortable. With the paper collages, the collages in frames, I wanted to use these black areas as holes and gaps. The gaps are making that suggestion of movement, even though they're still images, but there's that suggestion that the, that the legs could move together, or an arm could move round, or a head could move round. 
I used a circular frame for all my collages as well. So your eye scans a circular frame in a very different way. It doesn't look necessarily from left to right or right to left. It can't settle in quite the same way. So that means kind of everything in the image, in, if you like, has have equal value. And also the circular motif has links to the eye, to a lens, to a mirror, which is, a, is perhaps a clearly obvious um, association because the pictures were hung at kind of eye height as if you were looking at a weird version of yourself in the mirror and also they've got the link to holes and gaps if you are talking about female sexuality there is the illusion there um, with the hole and the bits inside the hole and the amount of hair and fur that I was using as well so that was a perhaps a more playful association Last year I was teaching in China, in Ningbo, and when I was thinking about what to do with this project, I found Dolores in a vending machine on campus, and just seeing her fitted into the ideas I was already thinking about exploring, which was female sexuality, the monstrousness of that, trying to explore the idea of a synthetic person, either for pleasure or for company. At the time, the campus I was in was very controlled, very party-led, so it was a strange thing to find. So I ended up purchasing her and I thought I would do something like a physical collage. I do think about the uncanny, things that are a little bit ugly, the human body cut up and, and collaged in different ways. So it was the idea of deflating the body, inflating her, cutting it up, doing all that type of thing to create some sort of almost like a monstrous type of object but what I didn't expect was the physicality of her you know she looked quite real in some parts like her hands and her feet were very real and very were made of silicon so they felt very soft but the rest of the body you know the inflatable part and her face were quite grotesque and funny and, and odd but, but not realistic at all. So it was the way that the hands would move when you'd inflate and deflate her would look really interesting and, and just very strange. So it, it felt more tender when I look back at the footage. It felt more soft, tender when, it, when I'd deflate her, her head would move so it would look like somebody sleeping. So I was a bit surprised by that. I think it changed the look of the whole, the whole film. I worked with one of my students called Barbara Bird, Jo Yan Yan, also from Ningbo. She wrote a poem as a response to the face, the piece of work that I'd, I'd just cut the face off Dolores and kept it because I just didn't want to part completely with her and I wanted, I wanted people to see the actual object that I'd been using. So she created a piece of poetry that went on the side of the glass box. Barbara comes from a really patriarchal family. She does a lot of work about the relationship between her mother and her father and how her father feels about her. So there was some of that in there. So I quite liked the two perspectives from two different cultures. When I was looking at other artists who'd used a doll or a figure, there were people like Hans Bellmer, who I was definitely influenced by when I was younger, and Oscar Kokoschka. Both of those were people who'd used female dolls in their work and done the same thing where they created almost 3D collages and created photographs from that. But their motivations seemed to be more about destroying an image of a woman that had spurned them or a destroying a woman. For me, it was more about releasing something, creating something new and creating this ugly, beautiful, strange object. So it's another, it's another perspective on maybe what's already been done. I'd quite like to see other female artists do something similar or do, you know, do something with that idea and see what they come up with too. All forms of, of uh, representation are, are, you know, partial. I mean, I grew up in, in as I said, in Belfast in, in the 70s when I was a child. And even as a child, uh, watching the news about events that I had experienced. Uh, how that was represented in the news wasn't, wasn't wrong, but it wasn't described in the terms that I understood. 
what was happening. Uh, and so that really stayed with me, actually. Um, and it's, it's an intensely frustrating experience to be represented and to be represented in a way that you don't recognize. And, and so really there's, that's probably a very foundational experience and why uh, I, 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 I'm, I do what I do actually, <laughs> why I've set this whole thing up.